you've taken a good look in the mirror lately, it may be hard to believe that you are made for eternity. But you know it's true, and that's exactly what our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, talks about in this study on Through the Bible, as we hold a mirror up to our lives and learn how a glimpse into eternity can comfort us, instruct us, and challenge us to live godly lives. But before we're called to enjoy eternity with the Lord, a lot is going to happen in His program on earth. I'm Steve Schwetz, welcoming you aboard the Bible bus for another great study in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And while you find your place at verse 13, here's an introduction from Dr. McGee on the rapture, what we believe is the next event on eternity's calendar. Last time we made it very clear that Paul, as well as the other New Testament writers, when he's speaking of the rapture, puts it always on the background of what the Lord Jesus said in John 14 when he's speaking about actually a first century wedding. When the bridegroom became engaged to the bride, he went away to prepare a place, and then he came to take the bride to be with him back to the father's house. And so the great anticipation of the church is the rapture. It gives a hope today. It gives a hope at the most hopeless time of life, and that's at the time of death. There's nothing as tragic as the death of a lost person. I tell you, many times you hear the howling and the screaming and the carrying on. Well, may I say to you, I don't blame them. They got no hope. But the child of God has a hope. The Lord Jesus is going to come one day and raise up that sleeping body of the believer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, nothing gives us greater hope than to hear of the eternity that you have planned for us in your presence. As the psalmist said, teach us your truth, your word is truth, and help us to follow you more closely every day until your Son comes again. In Jesus' very precious name, amen. We're off to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now today, friends, we return to this very important passage in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse 13. It says, But we would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are sleeping, that ye sorrow not, even as the rest which have no hope. The rest here, of course, are the unsaved pagan heathen in that day that were in the city of Thessalonica, and in the world for that matter. No hope, and the hopelessness of those without Christ is, I think, evident at the time of death, and it certainly makes a difference in folk. Now, Paul is making it very clear here when he speaks of sleeping, he's referring to the body, never to the soul or the spirit of man, because the spirit of man does not die. And we shall note that now as we move through this particular section here. I'd like for us to note the reasons that the death of body is spoken of as a sleep. And the first reason I would suggest is the similarity of sleep to death. A dead body and a sleeping body are actually very similar. I'm sure that you've been at a funeral where you heard somebody make this remark, well, so-and-so looks as if they were asleep. Well, that actually is true. The body is asleep of a believer, and a sleeper does not cease to exist. And the inference is that the dead does not cease to exist just because the body is asleep. Sleep is temporary. Death is also. Sleep has its waking. Death has its resurrection. Uh, Life is not just existence, and death is not non-existence, you see. Now, we need to note something else here. Second reason is the derivation of the word for sleep. The Greek word goes back to a root word, kemai, and kemai means to lie down. So again, may I say, that word could never refer to the spirit, because 
what position does the Spirit get in if it lies down? And the very interesting thing is that the word resurrection is a word that refers only to the body. The word is anastasis, and it comes from two Greek words, histomy, to stand, and ana, a preposition, means to stand up. Now, it's only the body that can stand up in resurrection. This idea that the Bible means a spiritual resurrection, there's no such thing as that. The spirit does not die, or the soul, and the soul and the spirit, they are not raised because they don't die. And we are going to see that only the body can lie down in death and only the body can stand up in resurrection. That is quite obvious. Paul could say that absent from the body was present with the Lord. And again, we have used in Scripture this idea of the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Even the Old Testament taught that. In Ecclesiastes 12, 7, it says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. That's our body, it's dust. God says to man, Dust thou art, to dust shalt thou return. What's he talking about? The soul of the spirit? No, it's the body that was taken from the dust and then God breathed into him the breath of life of the spirit, you see. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. Now that's Ecclesiastes 12, 7. So that we're talking now about the body and only the body. There's another great passage, and I think it would be worthwhile for us to turn back to it today. It's in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Let me turn there for just a moment that we might corroborate this, that we're talking about the body. Now, Paul says here, and I'm turning to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, the word for tabernacle here is skene, it means tent. And these bodies that you and I live in today are tents. Now, I do not care what kind of a home you live in. You may have a home that costs $250,000. But I have news for you. You live in a little tent, this body. That's really where you live. And there's no such thing as some people living in a slum area and some other. God put us all in a tent down here. And I'm told that if you take this body of ours, break it down into the different chemicals that is there that you could sell us today, even with inflated prices, for something under $4. Now, your house may have cost you $250,000, but my friend, you are living in a little $4 house, sort of a two-before thing called a tent, and it can blow down any minute. And if you don't believe it, you step out in the street and step in front of a car, and I'll say this, you're just about to fold your tent and silently slip away. That's what's going to happen to you. These are very frail bodies that we live in down here. Now Paul says this in verse 2. He says, For in this we groan, earnestly desired to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Now Paul says we groan within these bodies. And again in verse 4, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. We groan within these tents. Now, have you discovered that, my friend? I told an old man that I met him at a bus corner. Well, this is quite a few years ago. A gray hair, tottering step. He must have been mighty close to 80. He was swearing like a sailor. And I told him, I said, brother, I said, you won't be here very long. You're going to have to answer to God. He says, how do you know I won't be here very long? I says, well, hasn't God already told you you won't be here long? He's put gray in your hair, totter in your step, a stoop in your shoulder, and I have a notion that you have short breath too, by the way. And all he's trying to tell you is you're just not going to be around much longer. You're living in this little tent down here, and you're going to be slipping away. And my friend, you better make that decision now. God's trying to tell you something, and you're not listening to it. Years ago, President John Adams 
was taking a walk, and he met a friend. A friend said to him, says, how are you today, President Adams? Well, he says, I'm fine, but this house that I'm living in, it's coming apart. It's falling down. Well, that's the kind of a house that we live in. We groan, Paul says, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan. I know that when I moved in the place where I am now, I just had become pastor in downtown Los Angeles, and I really was a young man then. And I could bound up and down the steps up to my study and bedroom. But now today, it's different. When I come down the steps, I come down one at a time, and there's no more bounding. These knees of mine, I'd find out they hurt, and I groan. And my wife says, you ought not to groan. And I tell her it's scriptural to groan. I said, Paul says, we groan within these bodies, and I want to do my share of groaning. I believe in it, by the way. So that here, Paul talks about these bodies of ours. These are the bodies that are going to be put in the grave. They're put to sleep of a believer, and I can't think of anything lovelier than that. And the Spirit goes to be with Christ, Paul says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now here in 2 Corinthians 5, and I drop down again, he says this, verse 6, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Now as long as we are here at home in this body, this is my home I live in down here, you haven't seen me, many of you haven't seen me at all, but there are many of you that I meet from time to time as I go across the country, and they say, well, I came to the service just to see how you look. Well, I always feel like saying, well, you really haven't seen me. What you see is a head and two hands sticking out of a suit of clothes. You don't see me. I live within this body. You see the house I live in. It's not in such good repair, but that's what I live in. I'm on the inside. We walk by faith and not by sight. As long as we're down here, that's the way we're walking. But listen to Paul now, verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. And I tell the folk in my family, when you come by and see me someday in the casket, now that doesn't sound very bright, does it? You have to face the facts of life. I said, don't say he looks natural, because I won't. I won't even be there. My house down here will be there, and it's put to sleep and I'm going to go and be with the Lord. And at the resurrection now, and Paul's going to talk about that, the body's raised up. Many years ago, there was a meeting of the theologians and the leaders of the churches. That was back in the 20s, I guess it was, when the old modernism and fundamentalism argument was on. And they made one last effort, apparently, to try to get together. And so one of the liberals there, Greek scholar, read a paper on the spiritual body. And he took the passage in 1 Corinthians 15. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. And he put the great emphasis on the spiritual. And he just came down on that. He says, now, brethren, you can see the resurrection is spiritual because it says it's a spiritual body. Well, the liberals applauded him. In fact, they wanted to vote that the manuscript would be printed and given a wide circulation. And so there was their conservative Greek scholar, and he was the one who was tops for years in this country. And so he said, I have a question to ask Dr. So-and-so. And it became a death-like silence in that place because everyone knew this man could ask some rather cogent questions. And so this man who'd read the paper reluctantly stood up, and he said, all right, he'd attempt to answer it. Well, he says, it's a very simple question. You can answer it. He says, which is stronger, a noun or an adjective? And he could see the way this man was going. He said, well, of course, a noun is stronger than an adjective. And this man says, well, I'm really surprised and disappointed that you, an outstanding Greek scholar, have put the emphasis on the adjective and not the noun. You've given the wrong interpretation that Paul intended. Paul says it's sown a natural body. Body is the noun. Natural is the adjective. And it is raised a spiritual body. 
And he says the only thing that was carried over in resurrection was the body. That's what was changed. But it was still a body. But it's now a spiritual body. And the emphasis is on body, not spiritual. And, you know, they never did print that manuscript that man read. My, it was ridiculous when you really begin to look at it because it's the body that is raised up. And it's the bodies that sleep in the dust of the earth. And Daniel used that expression, Daniel 12, 2, that sleep in the dust of the earth. And Daniel knew about Ecclesiastes that Solomon wrote. And Solomon had said, the body will return to the dust. Dust will go back to dust, the body. But the spirit goes to God that sent it. Now, the early Christians, they had adopted a very wonderful word. They used the word koimaterion. That was the word they used for cemetery. And we get our word cemetery from that word. And you know what it was? It was a rest house for strangers. We call them inns. In that day, the inn was at Bethlehem. Every place had an inn, a rest house for strangers. You could spend the night there. And the early Christians called the cemetery. That was just a rest house. And a motel is where you sleep. And today we call them motels. We call them the Hilton Hotel or the Ramada Inn, the Holiday Inn, or the Howard Johnson Inn or the Royal Inn. These are places where you go and spend the night and you get up the next day and you're going to leave. And the very wonderful thing is that that is the picture of a place where you bury your loved one. You don't weep when you have a friend goes up and spends a weekend in a Hilton hotel, do you? You rejoice with them. Well, the believer, the body has been put in a motel just for the duration and one day he's coming and that body is going to be raised up, as Paul says. Now, will you notice as he goes on here, and I must continue to move on because this is quite a wonderful passage of Scripture that we have. Now, he says in verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and I'd have you note that it doesn't say Jesus slept. Actually, it says he died. And oh, how accurate that is. There's three kinds of death, actually. There's physical death, the separation of the spiritual from the body, and that's what we call death today. Adam actually didn't die physically until 930 years after the fall, but there's spiritual death. Paul says to be carnally minded is death. What does it mean? It's to be separated from God, and that's what happened to man in the Garden of Eden. When man ate, God says, the day that you eat, you'll die. And that means he'd be separated from God. And that happened because when God came into the garden, man, he ran. And God and man are separated, you see. And Adam did die the day he ate, a spiritual death. And the Lord Jesus Christ made that very clear that we are dead. And Paul says we're dead in trespasses and sins. And in Ephesians 2, 1, he says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. There was a famous judge that went around over this country years ago giving a lecture on millions now living will never die. Well, I followed him, a famous Baptist preacher, and he gave a lecture, millions now living are already dead. And they sure were spiritually dead. Then there's the eternal death, and that's eternal separation from God. Now, will you notice, Paul then makes it very clear. Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep or have fallen asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, this is very important, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, we shall not go before them which are asleep. Now, Paul says, You've been worrying about those that died before the rapture's taken place? He says, well, I want you to know they'll have part in the rapture. Fact of the matter is, we that are alive are not going ahead of them. They're going to come first. Now he puts it like this. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now this is a very important passage of Scripture that we've come to here. And I want to try to correct something, if I might, today. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven. I love that. He won't be sending angels. Now, when he comes to the earth to establish his kingdom, 
He's going to send his angels to the four corners of the earth to gather the elect, that'll be Israel and Gentiles in that day, to enter the kingdom. But no angel ministries connected with the church, friends. Angels announced the birth of Christ, but how did they announce him? Well, he was the son of David. He's the king. And that's the way that he's announced. He's to be a savior. But the important thing was a king is born. The wise men want to know where is he that's born king of the Jews. But when you're dealing with the church on the day of Pentecost, there were no angels. Well, the Holy Spirit himself came, you see. Now, when the Lord takes the church out of the world, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. And there'll be no angels. Angels are connected with Israel, but not with the church at all. He'll descend from heaven with a shout. Now, that's the voice of command. That word of command as he stood at the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. And then the voice of the archangel. Oh, somebody says, wait a minute. There is an angel there. Oh, no. His voice will be like the voice of an archangel. The voice of shout is that of an archangel. That is, it's the quality of his voice, the majesty and the authority of it. And then the trump of God. Somebody says, well, then there's a trumpet there. Oh, no, friends. His voice will be like a trumpet. Somebody says, can you know that? Sure you can. Turn over to Revelation 1.10, and there you will find John is exiled on the Isle of Patmos. He says, I heard a voice like the sound of a trumpet. Oh, there it is. He turned to see, and whose voice was it? The glorified Christ. And here comes the glorified Christ, and it's his voice is like the sound of a trumpet. Now, that ought to get rid of all of this foolishness about Gabriel blowing a horn or blowing a trumpet. I do not think that Gabriel even owns a trumpet. And if Gabriel owns a trumpet, I don't think he can blow it. And he won't need to blow it. Do you think the Lord Jesus needed Gabriel to come and help him raise Lazarus from the dead? Now, I do not mean to be irreverent, but can you imagine this? Here he is at the tomb of Lazarus. And he says, Gabriel, won't you come over here and help me get this man out of the grave? My friend, the Lord Jesus won't need anybody to help him. When he calls his church, they are coming up out of the graves, the bodies. And what's going to happen at that time? The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in there, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And I think that's going to be one of the most orderly things, the dead first. Here comes Stephen first out of the grave. He'll lead that procession. He's the first martyr. And then there will be the apostles. And then that martyr period when five million lay down their lives for Jesus, and then they will keep coming down through the centuries. And finally, if you and I are alive, we're going to bring up the end of the parade. We'll be way down at the tail end of it. You see, the church has already gone in through the door of death. Most of them have. Now, he says, wherefore, terrify one another with these words. Well, of course not. My Bible says, wherefore, comfort one another. This is something, friends, that ought to comfort you today. And what a glorious, wonderful comfort it is. And actually, it means not only to comfort in that sense, but actually to instruct and to exhort one another and talk about these things. Friends, Jesus is going to take his own out of this earth someday. What a glorious, wonderful day that's going to be. And the bodies of the dead will be lifted out. Then we that are alive, whoever's alive then, are going to be caught up together, and they're going to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we're going to ever be with the Lord, and we'll come back with him to the earth to reign with him at that time. And he's going to talk about that in the next epistle, but we're not quite through with this one. And next time we take 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. For more of Dr. McGee's great teaching on the rapture, download the booklet, The Rapture Comes Next, over at ttb.org. Or if we can help you find it, call 1-800-65-BIBLE. We always love to hear how God's using His Word to encourage and challenge you. So drop us a note or an email at biblebus at ttb.org, or you can always write to us at Through the Bible. 
Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Our exciting journey through God's entire Word continues, so hop aboard and invite a friend along for the journey. Until then, I'm Steve Schwetz for all of us at Through the Bible, praying the God of all hope blesses you richly as you walk with Him. Jesus Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world, and we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?